the 60s, a cultural roller coaster in America's past, the civil rights movement was gaining momentum. Anti-war protests became widespread as tens of thousands were drafted into the rapidly escalating Vietnam War. The conflicting values of the conservative elders and the liberal youth fueled a generation gap that created a countercultural revolution driven by individualism and an opposition to mainstream American culture. From this context, Abby Hoffman emerged as a provocative and paradoxical leader of the 1960s counterculture. He organized carnivalesque demonstrations in an attempt to force the nation to acknowledge its flaws. Hoffman's unorthodox style of leadership polarized public opinion, drawing both praise and criticism. These opposing reactions kept Hoffman in the public spotlight, where he was able to revolutionize protest and leave a legacy of individual empowerment that resonates in the protests of today. Born on November 30, 1936 in Worcester, Massachusetts, Abby Hoffman was always a troublemaker, balancing his stellar grades with his penchant for fighting teachers he disagreed with. He was an activist for many years, but it wasn't until he attended UC Berkeley that he experienced his first real protest. Hoffman led students against the House for Un-American Activities Committee for its attempts to arrest students suspected of being communist. Previous attempts to rouse the students were failures, but Hoffman soon realized that by adopting their hippie aesthetic, he could connect with his outraged peers and lead them in protest. The authorities ordered the students to disperse. They did not. Violence ensued. During the demonstration, Hoffman realized his burning desire to create change and would do so by leading numerous protests in the future. According to Hoffman, the only way to support a revolution is to make your own. Unlike previous leaders seeking to achieve a specific goal, Hoffman sought to empower individuals to pursue their own goals. He had the means, but preferred to leave the end up to others. On August 24, 1967, Abby Hoffman led a group of hippies into the New York Stock Exchange. From the visitors' gallery, they showered fistfuls of dollar bills onto the trading floor, causing pandemonium as the traders rushed to grab the money. The stunt was intended to enlighten the public on the greed of Wall Street. While it did draw attention to the questionable morals of capitalism, many considered it a disruptive and immature prank that was nothing more than a grab for attention. The stunt became national news and was Hoffman's first encounter with widespread media attention. He discovered that the media could be manipulated into broadcasting his actions and ideas. Hoffman made sure that this initial flare of media attention lit a fire of nationwide interest that would never die. Two months later, 100,000 people marched on the Pentagon in protest of the Vietnam War. Abby Hoffman recruited hundreds of protesters to aid him in his attempt to telekinetically levitate and exercise the Pentagon. During the event, youth protesters placed flowers inside the guns of nearby police officers, signifying that the unchallenged authority of the Pentagon had been dissolved. Although effective at conveying its point, the protest angered many who felt Hoffman and his supporters were disruptive to the war effort and had no respect for the armed forces. On New Year's Eve in 1967, Hoffman and his fellow radicals created a youth activist group called the Yippies. With the Yippies, Hoffman synthesized the anti-war ideology of the politically driven left with the Hippies' countercultural values. By bringing these two movements together, he further drove the counterculture youth into political activism. As a yippie, Hoffman wrote many bestsellers, such as Steal This Book and Revolution for the Hell of It, that drew even more attention to his ideas and served as a guide for the discontented youth. Being an anti-authoritarian group, the yippies claimed to have no leaders. Rather, as stated by Hoffman, we are all our own leaders. However, many outside the movement gave Abby Hoffman the title of leader because of his role in organizing protests. This created an unnoticed paradox. Anti-authoritarian groups are against leadership and the counterculture rebelled against authority. Gerald Lefcourt, Hoffman's lifelong friend and lawyer, helps us resolve this paradox. He wanted to organize them. So he wanted to look like them and speak like them and try to get them involved. And that's what the Yippie movement was really all about, organizing young sort of affluent dropouts, and there were tons of them. Because Hoffman led a group who resisted all forms of authority, he approached them as a peer and led them as a friend. 
This was the foundation of his leading not only the Yippies, but the counterculture movement as a whole. His first work with the Yippies was to organize another protest. In August 1968, Chicago hosted the Democratic National Convention. To protest the Vietnam War, Hoffman and the Yippies organized the Festival of Life, a demonstration filled with music and promises of peace. During the event, however, some demonstrators, encouraged by Hoffman, antagonized the police who were already hostile toward the counterculture youth. The festival soon erupted into violence as thousands of police officers aggressively dispersed the crowd by clubbing and tear gassing protesters, news reporters, and even innocent bystanders. The media broadcasted a torrent of images featuring the pandemonium. Hoffman's efforts for change further widened the generation gap, polarizing America with differing opinions on the Vietnam War, the authority of the government, and the radical youth movement. Another unintended consequence was Richard Nixon's election as president after making appealing promises of law and order amid such chaos. Although many protesters pushed the police into violence, Hoffman was understandably seen as the primary culprit for the riots due to his history of public disruption. Abby Hoffman's role as a leader caused him and six others to be charged with conspiracy to incite a riot. The Chicago 7 trial, as it was known, became a media sensation and was the height of Hoffman's fame and infamy. He and the defendants used theatrics in the courtroom to challenge the legitimacy of the charge. Many times throughout the trial, Abby Hoffman accused the judge, Julius Hoffman, of being his father. Later, he and fellow yippie Jerry Rubin entered the courtroom wearing judicial robes. These actions incensed many who viewed Hoffman's actions as a mockery of the judicial system. Though many of his supporters applauded his rebellious actions, some lost their respect for him. Like Hoffman's detractors, they disapproved of his courtroom decorum, believing that he had violated the sanctity of a fair judicial system. Ultimately, Hoffman was charged with contempt of court and spent a year in prison. Although polarizing, Hoffman's theatrics in the courtroom, as well as prior demonstrations, undeniably brought greater attention to the counterculture movement, and his creative methods of protest became the basis of a new style of protesting. Guerrilla protesting, as it is now known, is characterized by its use of symbolism and theater to better convey the message behind a protest. This type of rhetoric is especially well suited to the shorter attention span of the modern news consumer due to its direct and entertaining nature. Because of this, guerrilla protesting has become common today. Billionaires for Bush was a group that used satire and symbolism to protest the tax policies of President George W. Bush. The Occupy movement, like Hoffman's demonstrations, was crowdsourced and carnivalesque. With drum circles and public campouts, the Occupy movement was nearly indistinguishable from Hoffman's protests 40 years prior. The Hands Up Don't Shoot protests employed guerrilla protesting to call attention to the racial conflicts in Ferguson. Such demonstrations are living examples of Hoffman's legacy. All of them feature protesting methods that he instituted that emphasize media attracting entertainment as well as the empowerment of individuals. Hoffman's philosophy of individual empowerment revolved around motivating others to create change. To accomplish this, he said, the key is to organize people around what they can do, and more importantly, what they want to do. This philosophy served as the foundation of Hoffman's leadership and paved the way for modern methods of expressionism. Abby Hoffman's confrontational stance radicalized the 60s youth. Young citizens, whether attracted by his carnivalesque demonstrations or influenced by the values he espoused, began to participate in the critique of American society and its government. Understandably, opponents labeled him as anything from a buffoon to a terrorist. These opponents cited Hoffman's radical values disruptive protests, and constant media attention as clear examples of his attempts to destroy American values. Supporters of Hoffman, however, cited these same traits as innovative strategies he employed in enabling America's youth to create a nation that lived up to its ideals. Regardless of one's opinion on him, Hoffman's leadership accomplished its goal, empowering the individual to create change. This goal has outlived Hoffman, and his unconventional style of leadership has become the most influential aspect of his legacy. Even today, Abby Hoffman's legacy serves to lead people with the conviction that anyone can change the world.